again for the invitation to uh, participate in this workshop. I think it's been fascinating so far, and, and I intend to touch on a lot of the points that the other speakers have already made, and, and I think some points that uh, my colleague Hans Kirstedt is going to make uh, in his presentation. So there are a lot of slides here, um, and because this is more of a look back talk, I'm going to try to touch on a lot of key points rather than spend a lot of time talking about the actual data, because unfortunately that would take uh, the rest of the day or, and then some. So. Uh, with that being said, I think it's uh, helpful to sometimes take a step back and, and, and reflect upon how we got to where we are now, which I think will give us some insight as to how long things will take going <coughs> forward. And uh, when I joined uh, the laboratory of my PhD mentor, Paul Ryer, uh, who was one of the pioneers in fetal tissue transplantation for spinal cord injury back in the early 80s, uh, we really had no idea about how long it would, this process would take to, uh, to get to where it is now. But, um, but this is kind of an overview of that. Um, Paul, as I mentioned, was a pioneer with fetal tissue transplantation back in the early 80s. And for a period of roughly 10 years, uh, Paul and, and our other colleagues at the University of Florida had a very strong uh, spinal cord injury program there with Doug Anderson and, and several other uh, key investigators there. Did a whole series of studies in rodents and in cats showing very nice preclinical proof of concept of both efficacy and safety in spinal cord injury. And, and, and this really set the stage for, for a lot of what's been proposed in terms of how much preclinical data is needed now. So you need to show that you get replication across multiple laboratories, across multiple species, that you have a, a demonstration of efficacy and safety in an animal model larger than rodents, and in this case it was cats. And, and we did achieve all of that. And by virtue of some funding uh, through the very first program of its kind that I checked online today, and it still is in existence, it's now the Florida Brain and Spinal Cord Injury Program. And again, this was the model for the other programs and mentioned at the beginning of the day. That program provided dedicated funding to the University of Florida for the first time ever to translate this fetal tissue work into an initial feasibility and safety clinical trial, which we set up and conducted at the University of Florida from 1994 through 2002. So you get an idea of these time frames, 10 years of preclinical work leading to roughly eight years. The first three years was just laying the groundwork uh, by myself and my team to actually initiate this clinical trial, uh, which then took under, was undertaken over a period of the subsequent five years. So it was a very long process. While that tr uh, trial was, was uh, completing the follow-up of these patients, which were followed for up to two years, uh, there were some very exciting developments in embryonic stem cells, as, as many of you are aware. And, and, and Geron, my uh, previous company, funded the original development of that work by James Thompson in 1998. Uh, Hans Kirsted, then in his laboratory, extended that work to derive oligodendrocyte progenitor cells from the embryonic stem cells with funding through the Roman Reed Act in Geron in California, which again, in part, was modeled on the earlier funding in Florida. So you can, I think, begin to get a sense of the progression of, of how uh, this research was funded and how it evolved over a period now of two decades. Uh, in about 2003, Geron started laying the groundwork for uh, the clinical trial. I was still in academia, but started consulting for Geron in 03 and joined the company in 04. Over the period of the next five to six years, we really laid the groundwork for that clinical trial. And, and as I'll talk about today, uh, the follow-up of these patients is ongoing, even though recruitment has uh, been stopped for financial reasons. So I think this gives you an idea of, of, of just how long this process is and gives you some idea of how much longer in time we have to, to go forward. The good news is that because all of this work was done very carefully and very safely and we, we didn't harm anybody in the process of these two trials, it really has continued to push the field forward rather than set it back, which has been a, a concern for a very long time. Now this leap from animals to humans is, is, is still a matter of significant debate and, and as you heard today, for example, from Dr. Horner's presentation where he's got some very exciting data in, in rodents, how do we make that leap into humans and, and how much data is needed? And consensus is really difficult to achieve for very obvious reasons. One is that there are very disparate concerns and pressures between academia, industry, patients, and FDA. So in particular, just within patients, for example, many patients are more than happy to, quote unquote, be served as guinea pigs in a clinical trial, as long as there's a reasonable assurance that they're not going to be hurt by virtue of that participation. They're willing to take a chance on there being no efficacy if it leads to the advancement of scientific knowledge and overall advancement of the field. Uh, many people in academia and industry have very disparate concerns about 
how soon we should be trying clinical trials and, and how much preclinical data we should be generating. And of course, the FDA is concerned first and foremost on, on safety because if an industry sponsor or some other sponsor is allowed to conduct a clinical trial without having adequate assurance of safety, and that was given the go-ahead by FDA, then a lot of political pressure comes back to the FDA for not doing their job properly. So, so this really is a, a big challenge. And of course, the things that play into consideration is, well, how significant were, was, were the effects in terms of efficacy in your animal models? What's the appropriateness of the animal model to your proposed clinical indication? And has it been replicated by independent labs? Very, very important. Uh, that's been turned out to be very difficult for spinal cord injury in general. Of course, safety must always be tested first. And clinical testing really must necessarily proceed up this risk-benefit continuum. And that's exactly what we did in these two trials. It's what Wise Young has been doing in the trials they just described in China. And this is likely will be uh, ethically uh, how things will proceed appropriately in the future. So with regard to fetal tissue uh, grafting, there is reason for caution. And this is something that, I, I, again, I want to I put right up front here. Anytime you're dealing with cells that are proliferative or multipotent or cells derived from, from proliferative multipotent cells, you can get the ectopic tissue to form and that ectopic tissue can expand beyond the, the implant site, whether it's a tumor or not. So because the central nervous system is space constrained, even a benign cyst that is expanding can have very significant consequences I'll show on the next slide. So, it's very important that you have appropriately staged and prepared tissue. There are plenty of documented cases in literature now of people, for example, developing tumors in the spinal cord and or in the brain as a result of fetal tissue grafts that were inappropriately staged and prepared. And of course, this applies obviously to embryonic stem cell and other derived cells, including, for example, IPS cells, which themselves are pluripotent. So just to give you one example of this, uh, this was an individual who participated in one of the early fetal tissue trials for Parkinson's disease. Um, she uh, missed a couple of scheduled follow-up MRI scans and unfortunately developed very severe symptoms uh, that ultimately were diagnosed as a significant cyst uh, in the lower part of her brain, as you can see here, adjacent to the third ventricle. And unfortunately, because this was picked up so late, she, she did die from this expanding cyst. This was not a tumor. It turned out that the, the, the uh, tissue that was implanted was likely contaminated with a small number of cells known as choroid plexus. Uh, which forms cerebrospinal fluid. These are cells normally found in the brain, and they in fact line the ventricles in the brain, and their function is in fact to produce CSF. But if it's produced in an abnormal location, it can have fatal consequences. So I think this is a very uh, illustrative point of, of why we need to be careful about, about these cell-based trials. So you've already heard uh, from Dr. Tanzi about, about cellular repair of the injured <coughs> spinal cord. I'm not going to go through these points. Just other than, again, re-emphasize re that the cells are difficult because of the fact that they do, in fact, have multiple potential mechanisms of action, which could be acting synergistically at the same time or perhaps acting synergistically over, over, in sequence over, over time. And, and so that makes it really, really difficult to understand exactly what a cell-based therapy might be doing in the spinal cord. And as, as Dr. Young uh, pointed out, and as Dr. Tansy pointed out, what we really need to do is we really need to improve our armamentarium of tools such as electrophysiology and diffusion tensor imaging to really try to tease out as best we can what these cells uh, might be doing in terms of impacting the injured spinal cord. So back to the tissue work then was done at the University of Florida. We did a lot of work in, in the labs of Paul Ryer and my postdoc mentor Doug Anderson. Very nice grafts, well vascularized. They had excellent confluence with the adjacent host spinal cord. Very little evidence of scar formation in between the graft and the, and the host spinal cord. We then subsequently, in preparation for the clinical trial, showed that we could achieve similar outcome, transplanting human fetal spinal cord tissue that, again, was appropriately staged into the contusion injuries in the rat spinal cord. And what we showed very nicely was that when you take this immature tissue and you follow it over a period of time, that although a lot of the cells in the body of the graft actually, here now expressing a marker at MAP2, are, have a very immature phenotype, that the cells that migrate out and interact very nicely with the rat spinal cord start to uh, exhibit processes and a much more mature neuronal type phenotype uh, in these transplants. Uh, this gives you an awkward. You typically see this hind limb motor deficit. This particular animal had some persistent dorsal placement of the right hind paw. And they would be followed until they reached a stable level of, of rec spontaneous recovery <coughs> after this, and then they were transplanted. So typically this was eight to 12 weeks after the injury when the grafts were introduced, much like the chronic injuries that uh, Dr. Horner was mentioning in rats. And so one thing to notice here is that initially after transplanting fetal tissue into this injury, the animal actually was slightly worse than it was immediately prior uh, to implantation. 
But over a period of several months after uh, the implantation of this tissue in this particular animal, what you see is that there's a progressive improvement in hind limb recovery that is a combination actually of, of proprioception, where the animal is able to sense its feet relative to the board and, and to the other hind limb, and, and, it, and also a little bit of improvement in leg strength. And I'll come back to this in, in, in a patient we saw in the, in the Florida trial because um, we saw some very interesting parallels anecdotally uh, between things in the human situation as well as some of these findings in the cat studies. So without going into too much data uh, with regard to MRI, we were able to show very nicely we could monitor graphs as to whether they uh, had survived based on MRI signals and, and, and post-mortem histology or whether we got a very different type of signal on T1 and T2 MRI for failed transplants. So this was very important because you don't get 100% success survival or 100% survival of cellular grafts when you implant them into the injured spinal cord. So it's very important to be able to know or have some idea by MRI whether your graft actually succeeded and survived or not. So to summarize, literally uh, over a decade of work, and, and so this is really just, just barely scraping, scraping the surface here, uh, the folks in Gainesville, for example, were able to show a successful engraftment in both the rat and cat spinal cord, and again, this was replicated in many other laboratories around the world. Uh, there was a lot of neurophysiology a work that I didn't uh, talk about, uh, showing both neurophysiological and behavioral evidence of functional improvement, good pr uh, predictive survival of, or predictive value of graft survival by MRI, uh, we didn't see any evidence of appropriately staged grafts compromising host function, and I emphasize appropriately staged. We absolutely had anecdotal cases in the laboratory where a graduate student, for example, inadvertently implanted inappropriately staged tissue, and we got overgrowth of that tissue and significant compromise of the animal. It happened very, very rarely, but occasionally you saw it in, in these rodents. So we absolutely knew that there was the potential for impairment if one were careful. And we also showed in these studies that temporary immunosuppression potentially could lead to long-term graft survival in an allogeneic uh, type transplant, which is very relevant for the clinical set, uh, trial. So on the strength of all of that, we decided that in, in the early 90s uh, that it would be appropriate to undertake a, a pilot feasibility and safety trial of these fetal tissue grafts in, in human spinal cord injury patients. And, and a very important question was, what patient population is most appropriate from a risk-benefit uh, uh, scenario to start with? And after a lot of uh, deliberations and discussion with our clinicians, it was felt that patients who had suffered a spinal cord injury and then a complication that's very delayed called post-traumatic syringomyelia would be an appropriate population. And that's because this post-traumatic syrinx that develops by virtue of expansion of fluid in the spinal cord causes additional damage and is generally treated with by surgery, where the surgeon will go in and they'll actually detether and remove a lot of the scar tissue around the spinal cord, and often they'll place a shunt tube into the spinal cord. They'll actually open the spinal cord and put a tube in, and then siphon that out to a low pressure space, such as the, uh, the pleural space or the per uh, perineum, for example. And uh, so this felt, was felt to be a good uh, patient population to target initially. So it was just a non-randomized pilot study. The goal was to recruit 10 subjects, which we did recruit, <coughs> eight of whom received tissue. They did receive temporary immunosuppression with cyclosporin and were followed up to two years. Again, long-term follow-up is very important. And at the time, we used the standard battery of clinical assessments as well as a very intensive electrophysiological uh, battery of assessments. And uh, although I'm not going to talk about these, they were published by our colleague uh, Floyd Thompson in the, in the uh, part of a joint paper back in 2001 uh, in gene neurotrauma. So it's, uh, it's out there for you to read. The goals were really to determine feasibility and safety of the grafting procedure, assess long-term survival of the grafts, and to see whether they could potentially help prevent re-expansion of these syrinxes after uh, implantation. Really to provide some information back to the laboratory about were we on the right track with our animal studies and were we asking the right questions. So this bench-to-bedside-to-bench -bench feedback continuum that you might hear about uh, from time to time is really very important because we really don't, aren't, aren't, we're, we're only able to answer or address very few questions in the context of a clinical trial. Uh, really, a clinical trial done well, as Dr. Young talked about, feeds back a lot of important questions in the laboratory that need to be addressed. We also felt that we were potentially going to be providing a template for future clinical testing of other promising interventions, such as stem cells, because as you all know, fe primary fetal tissue is ethically very controversial, and there are also some significant logistical hurdles uh, to that. And so this really set the stage for the Geron trial. And we wanted to look at the suitability of the available outcome measures at the time. So without going into details of the outcome measures, as you can imagine, we're going from neurophysiological testing, which is arguably very objective, but potentially has very little direct relevance to how a patient is doing in their quality of life, 
to things that are matter most to the individuals but are highly subjective and highly variable across subjects. So there's this whole continuum that really represents a challenge of assessing how well are we doing in terms of improving someone's condition. So with regard to uh, the, the summary of the individuals that participated in the study, there ended up being six males and two females, ages 45 to 66. They primarily had thoracic spinal cord injuries with a neurological level of T4 to T10. These were very chronic injuries. These, were, these individuals had injuries 12 to 31 years prior to receiving the fetal tissue in the study. So a very, very good template for looking at can we really impact the very chronically injured spinal cord. And I'll show you some data that suggests we can, much like Dr. Young just showed from the China, a trial in China. Um, Syringomyelia is typically a very delayed complication, so these individuals typically had onset of symptoms due to these expanding cysts anywhere from 2 to 17 years after their initial injury. And typically they would experience new onset of pain, additional weakness, and potentially worsening of, of any spasms. They generally had undergone multiple uh, previous uh, surgical procedures to try and treat <coughs> these cysts. And they had relief of symptoms anywhere from 0 to 3 years. So one problem with syringomyelia is those, although it responds very well to surgery in the short term, the long term outcome is actually much less favorable. And interestingly, these cysts, as is shown in the literature, varied quite considerably in their sizes. So the surgical procedure entailed detethering of all intradural adhesions, decompression of the cavities by needle aspiration or a small myelotomy. So again, this myelotomy where you cut the spinal cord is something that any neurosurgeon will tell you is done very commonly for intraspinal cord procedures, such as removing a tumor, treating a vascular malformation, or what have you, or in inserting a shunt in syringomyelia. The graft sites uh, extended primarily, uh, they were primarily in the, as you say, T11, from C6 down to T11, depending on the syrinx and the morphology. All of the initial patients were, were thoracic patients. The very last patient in the world had a low cervical injury. The, these were actually pieces of tissue that were actually minced up or either cut into long strips and either inserted mechanically with forceps or actually inje injected via syringe just by hand right into the cavity. And we were able to verify the placement of these grafts via intraoperative ultrasound. So this gives you an illustration of, of one particular case. This was a gentleman who had been injured in a, uh, in a farming ac accident. Uh, with his initial injury in the 1960s occurring down here at T12, he subsequently developed a syrinx, this black line that you see up the middle of his spinal cord and expanding quite lar into a large cavity in the middle, but then extending all the way up to his second cervical vertebrae. So literally, the entire length of the spinal cord is, is how long this cyst got. And what's interesting about this is that the first new symptom that he noticed happened to be he was leaning against his tractor one day, because he actually had a pretty good recovery from this initial injury, and he smelled something burning and realized that it was his skin burning on the hot engine. Okay, so he had had subtle loss of sensation up his upper extremity, and that was the first sign that something was wrong, despite the fact that he had this syrinx extending the entire length of his spinal cord. So uh, he became eligible uh, for syringomyelia surgery. So our neurosurgeon, Dr. Fessler, uh, it, he basically enrolled this individual. He threaded a, a, sh a shunt tube in here at T5 and ran it up to the cervical cord. And you can see that he achieved at three months out to two years very nice collapse of the uppermost part of the syrinx, which is causing the, the most uh, uh, worrisome symptoms in this individual. And then at the very base of this cavity, hopefully my laser pointer showed, we implanted fetal tissue. Now the total amount of fetal tissue that was implanted in this individual filled only the very lowest end of this part of the, of the cavity, T5-6. That gives you an idea of the magnitude of the amount of cells that were implanted versus the entire size of these cavities. It was very, very tiny. Um, just to give you an idea of what the inside of his spinal cord looked like, Dr. Fessler at the time used a state-of-the-art one millimeter outer diameter endoscope. And this is actually the withdrawal of the endoscope from the syrinx after it was inserted. You're actually looking at the interior of the spinal cord here. And although you typically think it's going to be a big hole, it turns out to be much more complicated than that. You see a lot of webbing and, and residual tissue in here. Some of these are undoubtedly blood vessels. Some of it is probably fibro fibroglial scar tissue. But the important upshot of it is that it's a very dynamic uh, environment, even in a very chronic uh, syringomyelia cavity, as you see here. And one of the other nice things that we, we did, as, again, trying to employ every state-of-the-art modality that we could get our hands on at the time to try and monitor what we were doing was to use intraoperative ultrasound to monitor the placement of these grafts uh, after they were inserted into the spinal cord. And so this is all intraoperative ultrasound immediately after the tissue is uh, introduced. So the individual is face down, so his back is up here, his face would be down here, and this is the syrinx where the tissue is implanted. And this is actually the spinal cord of the syrinx actually expanding and contracting with ventilation. It's well known that actually ventilation and, and arterial pulsations uh, cause a lot of motion within and of the spinal cord. And you can actually see floating in here 
this solid, this lighter mass in here is actually the fetal tissue immediately after implantation. So the important point is that this is not a static environment. You don't do an injection and the cells just sit there. There's actually motion that goes on even after you close the individual up. This may or may not impact the long-term survival or short-term survival of the tissue. This is an important question, something we don't understand yet. Um, at the opposite end of the extreme, we had an individual in the, in, in the study who actually was an Asia D. This is a very, very uh, aggressive uh, step for us. We initially demonstrated safety uh, in individuals who were Asia A. They had no preserved sensation or motor function in the lower extremities. Um, as we gained safety data and had other individuals like this one present, we went back to the IRB and said, look, we think we are safe to now go into individuals who are less severely impaired. What made that ethically acceptable was the fact that in the context of syringomyelia, even though this individual was 30 years out and was Asia D, meaning she actually could, could stand up, she was having very significant progressive uh, worsening of, her, of the weakness in her lower extremities to the point where she was becoming almost unable to stand up anymore. So on the virtue of, of that progression of symptoms, uh, we felt it was ethically acceptable to go ahead and, and implant fetal tissue into this small, very small cavity at the T5, T6 uh, juncture. And as you can see out through the first year, we had very good uh, filling, although at one year, and a little less obvious here, but I think more on the uh, axial scans here, there was some regression of the tissue. So these are consecutive axial cuts uh, through the, through the, uh, the syrinx at, at, um, at baseline. At three months, there's very good filling of it by signal uh, tissue that appears to be tissue as opposed to CSF. At 12 months, there seems to be some loss of that tissue, and it's a little bit worse out of two years. One of the things that's very intriguing, and yet another question to take back to the laboratory, is we withdrew immunosuppression at six months per protocol. And the question is, after we withdrew immunosuppression, is this a sign that, in fact, that the allogeneic tissue was immunologically rejected in this individual? We, we don't know the answer to that, but it's very important. So in MRI, what we found is that most of the individuals, at least early on, had evidence of collapse of the cyst at the graft site, although, again, pushing the limits of technology, we didn't really have a con conclusive way to say whether or not that was donor tissue or whether it was just simply collapse of the cyst. So, so that's very, very uh, important and something, obviously, uh, where we need to look, continue looking at ways to label implanted cells in a way that's detectable on a non-invasive imaging modality, such as MRI or some other modality. We never saw any evidence of, of graft overgrowth or inflammatory reactions, so there are very distinct ways to pick this up in MRI, and there was no evidence of that. So that was very encouraging. There was partial <coughs> accumulation of CSF in the graft site in six of eight of subjects. So definitely raises the, the specter that our immunosuppression regimen was insufficient in, in terms of what we did. Uh, and obviously, it would be better to have improved spatial resolution. We were imaging individuals at 1.5 Tesla, which was state of the art at the time. But to give you a comparison, these are post-mortem excised human spinal cords that we had imaged uh, at around the same time in our 14 Tesla magnet. And at 14 Tesla, you can get images with sufficient spatial resolution that they almost look like tissue sections under a microscope. But this is actually, these are actually MRI scans of post-mortem uh, cord. And in fact, at this resolution, you can actually see from a patient who was injured very nicely discrete areas of demyelination or degeneration of the dorsal columns that would be completely uh, uh, un unapparent on a clinical scan. So how did these patients do? Overall, we saw no change for baseline. So no change in total motor score, light touch, or pinprick. Pretty much what you'd expect for this population. But as you start to delve in into a little more, with a little more granularity, you see some interesting findings emerge. So if you look at total, total motor scores, for example, there were sort of three distinct subgroups of patients. The patients who were Asia A had a motor score of 50, and that didn't change. What that meant was they had normal, normal motor function in their arms, nothing in the legs going in, and that persisted all the way through the study. The individuals that came in as Asia, Asia C's who had some motor function but had a lot of spasticity, which made the clinical exam interpretation difficult, had a lot of bounce uh, over time. And several of them, at least a couple, actually exhibited progressive long-term decline, which would be consistent with progression of syringomyelia. So we didn't, we didn't help these individuals. And then there was a latter group uh, of two individuals who were actually Asia D that came in, and both of which actually had a slight improvement from, from the low 90s on their Asia score up to uh, high 90s and even 100 points in one case. Um, interestingly enough, the individual here, uh, subject number seven, who uh, got up to 100, uh, was dissatisfied with how well he did in the study and dropped out. <laughs> he really wanted to go back to the gym and work out and be normal. Um, just to give you a little, little more information about this individual, um, he was evaluated by representatives from the brain, Florida Brain and Spinal Cord Injury Program, completely independent of our study, who happened to be uh, at his home in the area after he had, had dropped out. And they wanted to see if he had any unmet medical needs. 
And he said, well, I lose my balance sometimes. You know, maybe you could help with that. And they said, no problem. We can install handrails and other assistive devices within your home. And he said, no, I get around my home just fine. But when I'm working in my garden, I lose my balance sometimes and fall over. So, so in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of subject expectations relative to, I mean, any one, any one of these other subjects in the study would have, would have obviously really liked to have had the, the misfortune that this individual had. But this is something very important to bear in mind when we talk about outcome measures and quality of life. Um, the one individual, subject five, who I was just mentioning is the one in the red here. And although the, the overall improvement in motor function was relatively modest, she had a very profound improvement in her appropriate sense of proprioception in terms of where her feet were relative to the ground. And this was picked up on some pilot work that uh, our collaborator, Andrea Behrman, happened to be doing at the time where they were looking at ambulation of, of individuals on, on a gate mat, which would record footfalls and videotaping these individuals. So it turned out that this individual at pre-op, and remember pre-op here is 31 years post-injury, uh, she was able to walk with the assistance of two canes, which you see the little dots right here on the side, but she had weakness in her anterior tibialis muscle. She, she was grade two out of five, and, which means she couldn't oppose gravity with, her, with her, her right foot. And so you'd see a lot of toe drag on the right side here as she's crossing. At three months, much to our surprise, with no study-specific rehab other than just sending her back home, doing whatever she did and coming back, she really shocked us that she was able to, to uh, significantly walk better on the, on the gate mat and that this toe drop had improved. And it really um, became more evident uh, on some of the video work that, uh, that Andrea was uh, happening to do with this individual. So she had them walk at two speeds, a self-selected pace and then the fastest pace that they felt they could maintain safely. So this will give you an idea over the first year of, of her going home. So this the study was in Florida. She lived in Maine. She would go home after each assessment, and then she'd come back three months later, so three, six, nine, uh, and 12 months uh, afterward. She did come back all through 24 months, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have the video out to there. So this was basically, again, just asking her to do what she had been doing at, at home uh, prior to returning for each visit. She told us that her sense of balance had improved uh, and that her sense of proprioception had improved. And this is very important because these <coughs> are things that are not normally really studied very intensively on the Asia or now called Insky uh, clinical neurological exam. As you can see though, even at one year, she's still not normal. She still has, walks hesitantly. You can see it's definitely not a normal gait, but uh, it really uh, made a bit significant impact in her quality of life. Again, primary change was a change in proprioception, which again, harkened back to that cat that I showed you earlier. And it's something we really don't pay attention to. Now proprioception, as, as we didn't really talk about today, but I'm hoping maybe this will be a topic for a future meeting. The proprioceptive system in the spinal cord is fascinating, and it's intricately tied with the circuitry that Dr. Tanzi was talking about earlier. And, and it turns out that there are long proprio-spinal pathways, there are short, pro short proprio-spinal pathways, and it's very clear that they, they play a very important role in this type of recovery, yet the electrophysiological mechanisms underpinning that are very poorly understood. And maybe Dr. Can Tanzi, after my talk, you can Make a comment, say a couple words on that, I'll give you, give you a heads up. We also looked at pain. This particular individual had a pretty significant de decrease in the pain that she had. So we tried to uh, use standardized and state-of-the-art pain assays. So many of these people will have distinct regions and distinct types of pain associated with either original injury and or their syringe myelia. So coming into the study, she had three distinct types and areas of pain. She had, actually well, she had two coming in and then one uh, post-operative. But she had pain down in her legs that she described as a gripping, sharp, stabbing pain that radiates to the feet. She had pain over the surgical site, which was more of a kind of a knife-like stabbing. And then she also described pain that extended into her arms, which is more of an aching pain, although it was stabbing through her fingers. And she had a pretty significant decrease. Whether the transplant procedure had anything to do with that is unclear at this point. But to make a long story short, in terms of the summary, we were very happy that we didn't have any adverse events related to the grafting procedure. There were no serious adverse events related to immunosuppression. There were some mild adverse events which are expected based on cyclosporin and its known uh, side effects. Uh, there were no delayed adverse events related to the fetal spinal cord grafts. And, and our neurosurgeon, Dr. Fester, has in fact kept in touch with several of these individuals and, and anecdotally has told me that by their reports, now up through 15 years post-grafting, that this individual in Maine, for example, uh, has a stable, a stable course uh, for 15 years. Uh, what that means, again, it's only anecdotal, so I don't want to speculate on that. In terms of the lessons learned, which was back, going back to the title of the talk, we showed that we can, in fact, implant tissue into these uh, syrinx cavities safely. We know that clinical changes were, are difficult to detect in AASA subjects, which really emphasizes the need in clinical trials now to not only start safely, but figure out how to work up from Asia A's to Asia B's, C's, and potentially even D's, and certain investigators such as Armin Kurt and Zurich are actually doing exactly that. 
uh, as I mentioned, we, we saw subtle improvements in proprioception, which in an AGD subject can have a pretty significant impact on, on walking speed. MRI is very helpful, but still not definitive. And again, Dr. Young really already addressed a lot of that, even with more advanced techniques such as diffusion tensor imaging. Electrophysiology is excuse me, very, very helpful, as Dr. Tanzi uh, illustrated, but it's also very labor intensive. And so one huge need in the field, as I asked Dr. Tanzi earlier alluded to, is how can we standardize these methods? And, and, and equally importantly, how can we make them easy to do so that they can be rolled out efficiently across multiple centers? And then also the logistics, uh, this trial reinforced that the logistics of primary fetal tissue procurement and storage are really not conducive to multicenter trials. And without going into the details of this, it was myself, my study nurse, my technician putting in many, many, many hours to collect the tissue just for, just for an individual uh, subject. So there were a whole lot of uh, individuals associated and worked, who worked on the, both the preclinical and the clinical trial. I won't go through all the names, but just to acknowledge the many people that worked on the UF study. Am I doing on time now? Am I running over? Or? No, you're good. Go. Okay. So I'm going to move quickly now into the, 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 the trial we did at Geron, uh, which really in many ways uh, was templated upon a, a lot of the work that we did at the University of Florida. Surely, surely we had the same concern about starting with uh, proliferative source material and, and the possibility of... of um, uh, ectopic tissue growth or expanding sigma masses. Um, so just to uh, uh, or, or, or kick this off, the protocol for differentiating human embryonic stem cells into oligodendrocyte progenitor cells was in fact developed in, in, in Hans Kirstedt's laboratory at UC Irvine. And then that protocol was then subsequently transferred to Geron Corporation and then, and then uh, modified slightly so that it could be done into what's called current good manufacturing practices in our, in our GMP facility, which is something that FDA requires in terms of manufacturing reliability and safety for use in clinical trials. So the protocol that was developed at Hans's laboratory was a four-step protocol, starting with embryonic stem cells going into these yellow spheres or embryoid bodies, which were then plated and ultimately end up with a mixed population of cells that contain primarily oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, but was really a mixture of cells. It was not high purity, and Hans, you might be touching on generation of higher purity progenitor cells from the S cells in your, in your talk. Uh, these cells were then harvested, cryopreserved in liquid nitrogen, and they were ready to be used as needed at the hospital. So this alone was a significant advancement over the fetal tissue model because you could make these cells as many as you needed in batches. They could be tested with rigorous uh, quality assurance and quality release assays before being shipped out to hospitals and being available as needed. This allowed uh, the, the therapy to be administered fairly soon after spinal cord injury. So an important trade-off right now that's, that we're addressing in the field is with allergen egg cells, they're ready to go and could be administered 7 to 14 days after injury, as these were. Whereas autologous cells, such as the cells Dr. Horner mentioned, often require many weeks, sometimes even two or three months, to actually generate cells from the original starting cells to be implanted. So you wouldn't be necessarily be focused on chronic spinal cord injury as opposed to subacute. Uh, without going through all of the details, OPC1 showed a, a very exciting a, a plethora of biological activities. Um, some of our scientists, and this is published, showed that, that OPC1 produced a lot, uh, some very relevant uh, neurotrophic factors, particularly BDNF. Uh, in the shiver mouse model, we were able to show, actually Hans showed this initially, that we got nice myelination of axons. And Hans, more data that you haven't even seen is that when we cross the shivers with immunocompromised RAG2 gamma Cs, we got more than a 10, almost 100-fold increase in myelination because of the immunocompromised issue. So there's something about shiver mice that really impairs. So myelination is very patchy in shiver mice, but in shivers across RAG2 gamma Cs, you get really robust myelination. And also an incidental finding in our longer-term <coughs> studies was that these cells are angiogenic. So, so this was a finding that was actually picked up not by Geron, but by the pathologists that are independent CRO, looking at these tissue going, wow, we're actually seeing a lot of blood vessels, and they have to be associated with human cells. Um, Hans uh, did some very nice proof-of-concept work in his laboratory, which we repeated at Geron in multiple studies, showing better improvement in the animals that got OPC1 versus different types of controls. And what's, I think, very important is that this exact type of finding, both in terms of time course and magnitude of effect, has been replicated in other laboratories with OPCs from other, other starting uh, cell sources. Another very exciting thing that, again, was an incidental finding, and this is a very important uh, point for the field. Most academic laboratories only follow their animals for a period of about 8 to 10 weeks after cells are implanted after spinal cord injury, and that's because we got to get data so we can publish it and get that next grant, as anybody in academia will tell you. So you don't have the luxury, typically, of following your animals for 9 or 12 months, which is what the FDA required Geron to do for safety. One of the very exciting things that was serendipitous that came out of these studies was that by 6 to 9 months, we had 
far greater regeneration in these transplants than I have ever seen in my entire <coughs> career. So starting at low magnification and going through higher magnification, these blue bundles that you see here are literally bundles of remyelinate of myelinated <coughs> axons that have regenerated over the entire <coughs> length of, of these lesions. And they're amidst a sea of brown stained human cells here filling the cavity. In contrast, in control animals, you routinely get basically nothing uh, regenerated across the cavity. And this is not just a select example. We saw this in almost every single animal in these long-term studies. It was really astounding. Now, with regard back to preclinical safety, unfortunately, something that also came up in these long-term studies for the first time ever was never seen in animals that were only followed for two months. It was only seen in animals that were followed for four to six months or longer, were in fact these cystic structures uh, that were picked up as incidental findings on histology. Uh, we never had any animals that had any clinical adverse effects due to these, and we really at first didn't understand what was responsible for these until um, we started doing a deep dive back into the literature. And this is from a paper uh, uh, published out of James Thompson's group in the mid-2000s, actually, long after we had started the Geron preclinical work, actually, showing that, in fact, that when you culture embryoid bodies from human embryonic stem cells for long enough, they undergo, not unexpectedly, a lot of spontaneous differentiation. In fact, they form these little cystic structures lined with epithelial cells that express the exact same markers as we found in these ectopic cysts in, in, in the Geron trial. Now, the unfortunate aspect is, had we understood this biology sooner, we potentially could have undertaken improvements or refinements to the differentiation protocol to address this problem before we started going to the FDA for permission to start the clinical trials. Unfortunately, we didn't find this out until it was fairly late in the game, and as a result, the FDA put the Geron trial on hold twice because of two different studies that where, we, where we had this finding pop up in rats. So that represented a very, very significant and costly set of regulatory delays for Geron even starting the trial. And again, had there been greater federal funding for this type of basic research, we would have known about this issue potentially much, much sooner. Um, our in-house scientists showed that, that OPC1 has very low level of allogenicity, again, suggesting that potentially short-term low-dose immunosuppression could be sufficient. One thing that was learned in the field between the time of the Geron trial and this trial was in the Geron trial we use cyclosporin. It is now known, actually, that low-dose tacrolimus potentially leads to much better tolerance of, of allogeneic cells and low-dose cyclosporin for reasons that are not clear. So we actually went with low-dose tacrolimus. So that was another thing that was a learning uh, aspect of the field. Based on the preclinical work, we launched a phase one safety trial of GRN OPC1 in individuals with subacute spinal cord injuries. It was, again, an open-label phase one safety trial with seven sites. The goal was to enroll eight to ten subjects. Ultimately, five were enrolled before it was stopped for financial reasons. Based on all the preclinical data, it was felt that the most appropriate time to implant these cells was 7 to 14 days after injury, and the FDA initially imposed a 30-day stagger between subjects. So once an individual got cells, you had to wait at least a month. We subsequently were able to convince the FDA to, to allow us to reduce that to 10 days. I won't go through all the eligibility criteria. Again, these were individuals, though, with traumatic spinal cord injuries and the thoracic lesion, and they were all age A. Uh, the study scheme I somewhat have alluded to already, so there was a very intense screening and baseline period uh, that had to occur within the first 11 days after injury so that they could get OPC1 no later than 14 days after injury. Again, there was a very intensive MRI follow-up in all these individuals, a very intensive clinical follow-up, and a very intensive uh, immunosuppression and immunomonitoring uh, uh, program that was undertaken during this period when they were on immunosuppression and to some extent even afterward. In addition, FDA wanted some type of long-term follow-up for safety in these individuals, and what we came up with uh, that they agreed to was intensive follow-up to one year, followed by in-person follow-up to five years, followed by telephone follow-up out to 15 years. Uh, without going into the details of the surgical procedure, we felt it was best to actually use a device to, to very, hold the needle very steadily and, and to in, in, facilitate injection of these cells in a systematic way across centers. It's very, very difficult to do these injections by hand in the same way across every surgeon and every site, although Dr. Young showed uh, very nicely that it can, in fact, be done by hand. Uh, the dose that we started with was 2 million cells. This was, by our estimates, probably at the very low end of the potential therapeutic range, but it was the highest dose that FDA allowed us to start at for safety reasons based on the preclinical data. And the injection was made as a single injection of 50 microliters into the spinal cord. Uh, this was supported by some pig safety work that I performed with my collaborator, Miami Jim Guest. And the target site was five millimeters caudal to the epi, uh, injury epicenter. The reason for this is that these cells had significant migratory potential within the spinal cord. They could travel as far as five centimeters up or down from the lesion, primarily in damaged white matter pathways. <coughs> 
Won't go through all the trial endpoints again. It was basically the same thing that we had uh, uh, done in the Florida study. So again, focusing primarily on safety, looking at neurological function on the Inski exam, and trying to use whatever available outcome measures in addition to that we could get our hands on, such as the University of Alabama Index of Motor Recovery, the Spinal Cord Independence Measure, looking at pain and, and at, at data sets for bowel and bladder function. Um, just a couple of case uh, synopses here. Uh, through the time that, that I, I left Geron, so unfortunately I don't have data as of now because of the study being shut down and there being very uh, little information, if any, released uh, publicly. The first individual had a single neurological level at T6. Uh, this is a picture of the cells actually being injected uh, in this individual. Uh, there were no complications uh, during or after surgery. Uh, he's now completed two years of follow-up and to my knowledge he's had no uh, serious adverse events to date. Um, in fact, he's become a champion for spinal cord injury research and was the lead advocate for the bill in Alabama that you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, he did have a couple of mild adverse events related to the immunosuppression, not surprisingly. There were no unexpected neurological changes. He's had no significant improvement or worsening in his status. Uh, and there were no evidence of adverse changes on MRI, nor any evidence of cavitation on MRI. So the bottom line is, is again, in this individual, uh, the procedure appears to be safe, but again, there's very little ev evidence that, that there was any, any uh, sign of efficacy in this individual. Uh, the second participant also had a single neurological level of T6. Again, no complications and no adverse events uh, to date that I'm aware of. So again, uh, reconfirming that it was uh, uh, safe. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this is where things stand. There were five subjects enrolled through November of 2011 when enrollment was stopped for financial reasons by Geron. Uh, there have been no serious adverse events reported publicly to date that I'm aware of, and the first subject is now over two years out. So what did we learn from, from this uh, 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 decade of work, if you will, at Geron? Well, one big issue was that embryonic stem cell development uh, really was uh, significantly hampered from 1998 through 2008 due to lack of federal funding. Had, there, I, I didn't go into all the details, were an awful lot of additional basic science experiments Geron really had to do to really understand the characterization of our cells, how to really define markers for these cells and release assays and those kinds of things. A lot of very interesting scientific work that ideally should have been done earlier in a basic science lab. As I mentioned, there were cellular impurities that we didn't fully appreciate until very late in the state, uh, late in the process, uh, that could have been picked up had there been greater funding for basic research. And uh, what we did learn, though, is that with appropriate safeguards, these cells can be administered safely and haven't caused any serious adverse events. So that actually helped move the field forward. And an MRI follow-up does remain challenging due to the prevalence of spine fixation. And I didn't show any MRIs to these individuals, but as Dr. Young showed earlier, virtually all spinal cord injury patients now in the U.S. actually get fix internal fixation of the spine with metal hardware. And even if it's state-of-the-art titanium, you still get artifacts that often obscure the spinal cord partially or completely, and generally speaking, make things like diffusion tensor imaging all but impossible in those individuals. So there are new materials that are out there. They haven't made their way to spine trauma. So for example, there's a material called poly, um, polyether ether ketone, peak if you will, which is very MRI compatible. Uh, but my understanding, and maybe Dr. Wynn can comment later, uh, it's not yet considered to be strong enough for use in spine trauma, unfortunately. So just finally to acknowledge my, uh, the many people again who worked on this, both at Geron as well as in Hans Kirstedt's lab, and our clinical sites and the various advisory committees who really helped make sure that this study was done properly. I'd like to thank all of them. So thank you and hopefully I didn't run too far over. So these results actually harken back to a comment that Hans made in our very first 2008 workshop when we were talking about the Geron trial. <laughs> And we were doing it in the whispers because it hadn't started yet. And everybody knew it would. And finally, the elephant in the room, Hans said himself, he said, what if, what if it hurts somebody? You know, what if there's a, an adverse event? And of course, that was the fear. I mean, that was the hope had, was to get it going. And, and what if something terrible happened? And now we know, for at least five people, that part is not true. That's a very small number. But at least that elephant in the room can probably have <coughs> put aside a little bit especially with all the other safety data that we have now. So we have a time. Do we have any online questions, Ryan? Yeah, we do. We have a, uh, a question from Italy. Um, the uh, user would like to know, I would like to ask Edward what he thinks about combining cells with biomaterials for the future, since many are exploring this line of research. 
Yeah, it's an excellent question. I think that there is um, a lot of reason to explore the combination of cells and biomaterials. Uh, one of the things we know from many of these cellular trials, both preclinically and clinically, is that many of the cells that are implanted, in fact, not, in fact most, typically die within the first 24 hours after they're in implanted. Uh, generally, the cell death is, uh, is upwards of 90 percent. And it's felt that there's only a small residual population of cells that are able to adhere to the lesion cavity get enough glucose and oxygen in that immediate post-transplant period to survive, proliferate, and repopulate into that injury cavity. So it's potential, conceivable that actually preceding the cells on a scaffold of a biomaterial that's, for example, bioresorbable, will really help these cells survive that early post-transplant period. So um, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Are there any others? There's another one from online. Um, from, uh, I'm not sure where this user's from. Can you ask how much uh, Geron invested until the moment the trial was stopped, and how much money would have been necessary to complete it? It's a great question. It's, it's, it's difficult to dissect the finances at Geron because they had two very disparate programs. There was the embryonic stem cell program, and there was the oncology program, which was completely different. The overall research burn rate at Geron per year when I was there while this work was going on was on the order of about 20 million to 30 million dollars for the stem cell program, 20 to 30 million for the cancer program. Within the stem cell program, however, there were, there were in itself multiple efforts. There was the OPC effort for spinal cord injury, there were, we were looking at cardiomyocytes for heart disease, islet cells for diabetes, and several other stem cell programs. So if we were to focus just on the spinal cord injury program, that could have continued to the tune of just a few million dollars per year. And in fact, probably the biggest disappointment, is, as many of you may have read in the news, was that in May of 2011, we were successful in receiving a $25 million grant, technically it was a back-end loan, from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine that was matched by $25 million from Geron. That $50 million easily could have taken this program by itself through phase one and phase two clinical trials, without a doubt. If, if that were the only use of those funds, but unfortunately, just, things didn't work out, so. Yeah. We have one question here, Bill. Uh, Ed, uh, you know, the microcysts, was, was that, uh, there were two things that were very interesting. I mean, one was this sort of slow filling in, you know, the gap, and I wondered if that was associated with any late return of function. That was the first question, but the second question has to do with the microcysts. Was that, was it, other than the obvious that it's not what you intended to have, was there any, what was the counterindication of having microcysts, or was there any? None whatsoever. We, we looked statistically every which way we could in, in those studies, and we had different studies with different uh, batches that had different amounts of these epithelial cells. So some had very few epithelial cells, or we saw only microscopic cysts. Other batches had many more of these epithelial cells with a greater number of these cysts and even larger cysts. And so they weren't always microscopic, actually. Um, and we looked at all the other parameters and, and looked basically at covariates and what have you. We didn't see any correlation with any clinical function in the animals, any, any correlation with any other clinical signs or any other tox parameters, if you will. So they didn't correlate with any of the court. So the, late, so the late regeneration and filling in and all the fibers, yeah. was that associated with any late? Functional change, or was that was that because was that all part of a safety study? It was part of a safety study. So although we did do in some of those safety studies long-term BBBs, they were infrequent, and it really wasn't yeah. designed to look at, at, yeah. at efficacy. It was very much a serendipitous finding. So it really raises the point I think you're getting at. We really need to look at effic longer-term efficacy yeah. in some of these non-clinical animal studies, and it's a challenge because it is the cost of keeping animals around for so long and evaluating them. But it's a very important thing that needs to be done. Yeah. Is there, are there any pressing questions online? I have, oh, no. we, we have to go. I have one other question that I think he's the person to ask, which is, I think, there seems, the one thing that hasn't been brought up is you know, we're putting cells in and we're trying to look at them by MRI or whatever, and we're sort of looking at shadows. And I mean, I think your background in MRI and physics and so forth, you must have a sense of whether there is anything coming down the pike for labeling cells so that we can possibly identify them. Is that a long ways away? And is and I assume that part of the complication is also getting through the FDA to combine these therapies. But so is that an unrealistic option in the near future, or is it's, it? It's 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 a real conundrum. There there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of progress on different labeling strategies, both exogenous as well as, for example, via genetic you know means. Um, if you look at Faradex, for example, that's that's probably the logic one to look at. So yeah. Faradex had by far it was it was an iron oxide based agent already approved for clinical use for liver imaging. Okay. And Joe Frank and his colleagues at NIH did the yeoman's effort 
going through all of the preclinical safety studies to show they could use it to label cells and track them, for example, in the CNS, CNS in the along with Jeff Bolte. And unfortunately, right when they were ready to file their IND, or right after they filed their IND, the company decided <laughs> for, not for financial reasons to stop making Faradex. Okay. And so literally a decade worth of work went down the tubes. So that's, that's the nature of, of the cell labeling side of it. I'm, I'm optimistic that more of these agents can come along, and there are some very exciting ones, but uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Thank you so much. Andrew. For those of us who followed the Geron trial so closely, that's like hearing the other shoe drop to know exactly at least what we know from the outcome. Has Geron published any of that? No, and we have been um, trying uh, to get permissions to publish the data to date, Ian. Mm -hmm. um, the current management has not expressed any interest in that happening. Um, and what we're hoping is really? that Oi. when Geron <coughs> follows through on divesting its stem cell assets, that whoever picks those assets up would be uh, interested in allowing that data to be published. So that's, that's Is there anything we can do to encourage them? <sighs> not that I'm aware of. I mean, it really, it really unfortunately just boils down to no dollars. And um, it's, it's very unfortunate, but yeah.